Section 21 of Library of World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 21. Zadig the Babylonian, by Voltaire. Part 4. The Hermit. While he was thus sauntering, he met a hermit, whose white and venerable beard hung down to his girdle. He held a book in his hand, which he read with great attention. Zadig stopped, and made him a profound obeisance. The hermit returned the compliment with such a noble and engaging air, that Zadig had the curiosity to enter into conversation with him. He asked him what book it was that he had been reading. "'It is the Book of Destinies,' said the hermit. "'Wouldst thou choose to look into it?' He put the book into the hands of Zadig, who, thoroughly versed as he was in several languages, could not decipher a single character of it. This only redoubled his curiosity." "'Thou seemest,' said this good father, "'to be in great distress.' "'Alas!' replied Zadig, "'I have but too much reason.' "'If thou wilt permit me to accompany thee,' resumed the old man, "'perhaps I may be of some service to thee. "'I have often poured the balm of consolation "'into the bleeding heart of the unhappy.' Zadig felt himself inspired with respect for the air, the beard, and the book of the hermit. He found, in the course of the conversation, that he was possessed of superior degrees of knowledge. The hermit talked of fate, of justice, of morals, of the chief good, of human weakness, and of virtue and vice, with such a spirited and moving eloquence, that Zadig felt himself drawn toward him by an irresistible charm. He earnestly entreated the favour of his company till their return to Babylon. I ask the same favour of thee, said the old man. Swear to me by Oromazes, that whatever I do, thou wilt not leave me for some days. Zadig swore, and they set out together. In the evening the two travellers arrived in a superb castle. The hermit entreated a hospitable reception for himself and the young man who accompanied him. The porter, whom one might have easily mistaken for a great lord, introduced them with a kind of disdainful civility. He presented them to a principal domestic, who showed them his master's magnificent apartments. They were admitted to the lower end of the table, without being honoured with the least mark of regard by the lord of the castle. But they were served, like the rest, with delicacy and profusion. They were then presented with water to wash their hands, in a golden basin adorned with emeralds and rubies. At last they were conducted to bed in a beautiful apartment, and in the morning a domestic brought each of them a piece of gold, after which they took their leave and departed. "'The master of the house,' said Zadig, as they were proceeding on the journey, "'appears to be a generous man, though somewhat too proud.' He nobly performs the duties of hospitality. At that instant he observed that a kind of large pocket, which the hermit had, was filled and distended, and upon looking more narrowly he found that it contained the golden basin adorned with precious stones, which the hermit had stolen. He durst not take any notice of it, but he was filled with a strange surprise. About noon the hermit came to the door of a paltry house inhabited by a rich miser, and begged the favour of a hospitable reception for a few hours. An old servant, in a tattered garb, received them with a blunt and rude air, and led them into the stable, where he gave them some rotten olives, mouldy bread, and sour beer. The hermit ate and drank with as much seeming satisfaction as he had done the evening before and then, addressing himself to the old servant, who watched them both to prevent their stealing anything, and rudely pressed them to depart, he gave him the two pieces of gold he had received in the morning, 
and thanked him for his great civility. Pray, added he, allow me to speak to thy master. The servant, filled with astonishment, introduced the two travellers. Magnificent lord, said the hermit, I cannot but return thee my most humble thanks for the noble manner in which thou hast entertained us. Be pleased to accept this golden basin as a small mark of my gratitude. The miser started, and was ready to fall backward, but the hermit, without giving him time to recover from his surprise, instantly departed with his young fellow-traveller. Father, said Zadig, what is the meaning of all this? Thou seemest to me to be entirely different from other men. Thou stealest a golden basin, adorned with precious stones, from a lord who received thee magnificently, and givest it to a miser who treats thee with indignity. Son, replied the old man, this magnificent lord, who receives strangers only from vanity and ostentation, will hereby be rendered more wise, and the miser will learn to practice the duties of hospitality. Be surprised at nothing, but follow me. Zadig knew not as yet whether he was in company with the most foolish or the most prudent of mankind. But the hermit spoke with such an ascendancy that Zadig, who was moreover bound by his oath, could not refuse to follow him. In the evening they arrived at a house built with equal elegance and simplicity, where nothing favoured either of prodigality or avarice. The master of it was a philosopher, who had retired from the world, and who cultivated in peace the study of virtue and wisdom, without any of that rigid and morose severity so commonly to be found in men of his character. He had chosen to build this country house, in which he received strangers with a generosity free from ostentation. He went himself to meet the two travellers, whom he led into a commodious apartment, where he desired them to repose themselves a little. Soon after he came and invited them to a decent and well-ordered repast, during which he spoke with great judgment of the last revolutions in Babylon. He seemed to be strongly attached to the queen, and wished that Zadig had appeared in the lists to dispute the crown. "'But the people,' added he, "'do not deserve to have such a king as Zadig.' Zadig blushed, and felt his griefs redoubled. They agreed, in the course of the conversation, that the things of this world did not always answer the wishes of the wise. The hermit still maintained that the ways of providence were inscrutable and that men were in the wrong to judge of a whole, of which they understood but the smallest part. They talked of passions. Ah, said Zadig, how fatal are their effects! They are in the winds, replied the hermit, that swells the sails of the ship. It is true they sometimes sink her, but without them she could not sail at all. The bile makes us sick and choleric, but without bile we could not live. Everything in this world is dangerous, and yet everything is necessary. The conversation turned on pleasure, and the hermit proved that it was a present bestowed by the deity. For, said he, man cannot give himself either sensations or ideas. He receives all, and pain and pleasure proceed from a foreign cause as well as his being. Zadig was surprised to see a man, who had been guilty of such extravagant actions, capable of reasoning with so much judgment and propriety. At last, after a conversation equally entertaining and instructive, the host led back his two guests to their apartment, blessing heaven for having sent him two men possessed of so much wisdom and virtue. He offered them money with such an easy and noble air as could not possibly give any offence. The hermit refused it, and said that he must now take his leave of him, as he set out for Babylon before it was light. Their parting was tender. Zadig especially felt himself filled with esteem and affection for a man of such an amiable character. When he and the hermit were alone in their apartment, 
they spent a long time in praising their host. At break of day the old man awakened his companion. "'We must now depart,' said he. "'But while all the family are still asleep, I will leave this man a mark of my esteem and affection.' So saying, he took a candle, and set fire to the house. Zadig, struck with horror, cried aloud, and endeavoured to hinder him from committing such a barbarous action. But the hermit drew him away by a superior force and the house was soon in flames. The hermit, who, with his companion, was already at a considerable distance, looked back to the conflagration with great tranquillity. "'Thanks be to God,' said he, "'the house of my dear host is entirely destroyed. Happy man!' At these words Zadig was at once tempted to burst out a-laughing, to reproach the reverend father, to beat him, and to run away. But he did none of all of these, for still subdued by the powerful ascendancy of the hermit, he followed him, in spite of himself, to the next stage. This was at the house of a charitable and virtuous widow, who had a nephew fourteen years of age, a handsome and promising youth, and her only hope. She performed the honours of her house as well as she could, Next day she ordered her nephew to accompany the strangers to a bridge, which being lately broken down, was becoming extremely dangerous in passing. The young man walked before them with great alacrity. As they were crossing the bridge, Come, said the hermit to the youth, I must show my gratitude to thy aunt. He then took him by the hair and plunged him into the river. The boy sunk, appeared again on the surface of the water, and was swallowed up by the current. "'O oh, monster! O oh, thou most wicked of mankind!' cried Zadig. "'Thou promised to behave with greater patience,' said the hermit, interrupting him. "'Know that under the ruins of that house which Providence hath set on fire, the master hath found an immense treasure. Know that this young man, whose life Providence hath shortened, would have assassinated his aunt in the space of a year, and thee in that of two. "'Who told thee so, barbarian?' cried Zadig. "'And though thou hast read this event in thy book of destinies, art thou permitted to drown a youth who never did thee any harm?' While the Babylonian was thus exclaiming, he observed that the old man had no longer a beard, and that his countenance assumed the features and complexion of youth. The hermit's habit disappeared, and four beautiful wings covered a majestic body resplendent with light. "'O oh, scent of heaven! O oh, divine angel!' cried Zadig, humbly prostrating himself on the ground. "'Hast thou then descended from the Empyrean, to teach a weak mortal to submit to the eternal decrees of providence? Men, said the angel Jezrad, judge of all without knowing anything, and of all men thou best deservest to be enlightened. Zadig begged to be permitted to speak. I distrust myself, said he, but may I presume to ask the favour of thee to clear up one doubt that still remains in my mind? Would it not have been better to have corrected this youth, and made him virtuous, than to have drowned him? Had he been virtuous, replied Jezrad, and enjoyed a longer life, it would have been his fate to be assassinated himself, together with the wife he would have married, and the child he would have had by her. But why, said Zadig, is it necessary that there should be crimes and misfortunes, and that these misfortunes should fall on the good? The wicked, replied Jezrad, are always unhappy. They serve to prove and try the small number of the just that are scattered through the earth. And there is no evil that is not productive of some good. But, said Zadig, suppose there were nothing but good, and no evil at all. Then, replied Jezrad, this earth would be another earth. 
the chain of events would be ranged in another order, and directed by wisdom. But this other order, which would be perfect, can exist only in the eternal abode of the Supreme Being, to which no evil can approach. The Deity hath created millions of worlds, among which there is not one that resembles another. This immense variety is the effect of His immense power. There are not two leaves among the trees of the earth, nor two globes in the unlimited expanse of heaven that are exactly similar. And all that thou seest on the little atom in which thou art born ought to be in its proper time and place, according to the immutable decree of Him who comprehends all. Men think that this child who hath just perished is fallen into the water by chance, and that it is by the same chance that this house is burned. But there is no such thing as chance. All is either a trial, or a punishment, or a reward, or a foresight. Remember the fisherman who thought himself the most wretched of mankind? Or Amazes sent thee to change his fate? Cease, then, frail mortal, to dispute against what thou oughtest to adore. But, said Zadig, as he pronounced the word but, the angel took his flight toward the tenth sphere. Zadig, on his knees, adored Providence, and submitted. The angel cried to him from on high, Direct thy course toward Babylon. THE ENIGMAS Zadig, entranced, as it were, and like a man about whose head the thunder had burst, walked at random. He entered Babylon on the very day when those who had fought at the tournaments were assembled in the grand vestibule of the palace to explain the enigmas and to answer the questions of the grand magi. All the knights were already arrived, except the knight in green armor. As soon as Zadig appeared in the city, the people crowded round him, every eye was fixed on him, every mouth blessed him, and every heart wished him the empire. The envious man saw him pass. He frowned and turned aside. The people conducted him to the place where the assembly was held. The queen, who was informed of his arrival, became a prey to the most violent agitations of hope and fear. She was filled with anxiety and apprehension. She could not comprehend why Zadig was without arms, nor why Etobad wore the white armor. A confused murmur arose at the sight of Zadig. They were equally surprised and charmed to see him but none but the knights who had fought were permitted to appear in the assembly. "'I have fought as well as the other knights,' said Zadig, "'but another here wears my arms, and while I wait for the honour of proving the truth of my assertion, I demand the liberty of presenting myself to explain the enigmas.' The question was put to the vote, and his reputation for probity was still so deeply impressed in their minds that they admitted him without scruple. The first question proposed by the Grand Magi was, What, of all things in the world, is the longest and the shortest, the swiftest and the slowest, the most divisible and the most extended, the most neglected and the most regretted, without which nothing can be done, which devours all that is little, and enlivens all that is great. Etobad was to speak. He replied that so great a man as he did not understand enigmas, and that it was sufficient for him to have conquered by his strength and valour. Some said that the meaning of the enigmas was fortune, some the earth, and others the light. Zadig said that it was time. Nothing, added he, is longer, since it is the measure of eternity. Nothing is shorter, since it is insufficient for the accomplishment of our projects. Nothing more slow to him that expects, nothing more rapid to him that enjoys. In greatness it extends to infinity. 
in smallness it is infinitely divisible. All men neglect it, all regret the loss of it. Nothing can be done without it. It consigns to oblivion whatever is unworthy of being transmitted to posterity, and it immortalizes such actions as are truly great. The assembly acknowledged that Zadig was in the right. The next question was, what is the thing which we receive without thanks, which we enjoy without knowing how, which we give to others when we know not where we are, and which we lose without perceiving it? Everyone gave his own explanation. Zadig alone guessed that it was life, and explained all the other enigmas with the same facility. Itobad always said that nothing was more easy, and that he could have answered them with the same readiness had he chosen to have given himself the trouble. Questions were then proposed on justice, on the sovereign good, and on the art of government. Zadig's answers were judged to be the most solid. "'What a pity is it,' said they, "'that such a great genius should be so bad a knight.' "'Illustrious lords,' said Zadig, I have had the honor of conquering in the tournaments. It is to me that the white armor belongs. Lord Itobad took possession of it during my sleep. He probably thought that it would fit him better than the green. I am now ready to prove, in your presence, with my gown and sword, against all that beautiful white armor which he took from me, that it is I who have had the honor of conquering the brave Otamus. Itobad accepted the challenge with the greatest confidence. He never doubted but what, armed as he was with a helmet, a cuirass, and brassarts, that he would obtain an easy victory over a champion in a cap and nightgown. Zadig drew his sword, saluting the queen, who looked at him with a mixture of fear and joy. Itobad drew his without saluting any one. He rushed upon Zadig like a man who had nothing to fear. He was ready to cleave him in two. Zadig knew how to ward off his blows, by opposing the strongest part of his sword to the weakest of that of his adversary, in such a manner that Itobad's sword was broken. Upon which Zadig, seizing his enemy by the waist, threw him on the ground, and fixing the point of his sword at the breastplate. "'Suffer thyself to be disarmed,' said he, "'or thou art a dead man.' Itobad, always surprised at the disgraces that happened to such a man as he, was obliged to yield to Zadig, who took from him with great composure his magnificent helmet, his superb cuirass, his fine brassarts, his shining cushions, clothed himself with them, and in this dress ran to throw himself at the feet of Astarte. Cador easily proved that the armor belonged to Zadig, he was acknowledged king by the unanimous consent of the whole nation, and especially by that of Astarte, who, after so many calamities, now tasted the exquisite pleasure of seeing her lover worthy, in the eyes of all the world, to be her husband. Itobad went home to be called lord in his own house. Zadig was king, and was happy. The queen and Zadig adored Providence, he sent in search of the robber Arbogad, to whom he gave an honorable post in his army, promising to advance him to the first dignities if he behaved like a true warrior, and threatening to hang him if he followed the profession of a robber. Setoc, with the fair Almona, was called from the heart of Arabia, and placed at the head of the commerce of Babylon. Cador was preferred and distinguished according to his great services, he was the friend of the king, and the king was then the only monarch on earth that had a friend. The little mute was not forgotten. But neither could the beautiful Samira be comforted for having believed that Zadig would be blind of an eye, nor did Azora cease to lament her having attempted to cut off his nose. Their griefs, however, he softened by his presence. The envious man died of rage and shame. 
the empire enjoyed peace, glory, and plenty. This was the happiest age of the earth. It was governed by love and justice. The people blessed Zadig, and Zadig blessed heaven. End of section 21